Hello. So, we have already established some standard nice rules uh, translating sort of nicely from derivatives to integrals. So in particular, we've shown, right, that you can separate integrals over addition and subtraction signs, and we can take constant multiples in and out of integrals. And this is maybe not all that surprising because this was true for derivatives and true for limits, right? But there comes an issue when we run into some of the other rules like products and quotients and compositions, which again is maybe unfortunately not that surprising because we had these same problems when we were looking at derivatives, right? They didn't translate nicely from limits to derivatives and they still don't translate nicely into integrals. So in this particular video, our goal is to tackle composition of functions. Okay, so when we had a composition of functions, say f of g of x, and we were doing derivatives, we had to use the chain rule, right? So in particular, when we took the derivative of f of g of x, we had this f prime of g of x times g prime of x, right? We had that piece come outside and, and take the derivative. So our goal then is to reverse this process, right? The, the idea here with integration is always trying to reverse the derivative. And so we want to figure out how we can recognize this composition and sort of backtrace it. So in particular, our goal then is to recognize and then undo this end result of the chain rule, going from the sort of something that looks like the right-hand side and try to bring it back to this f of g of x. All right, so let's start with an example, right? So let's say we have, right, we're doing the derivative of e to the x squared. So again, we would do the derivative of e to the x squared as if it were just e to a thing, which is itself. But then we would multiply, right, by the derivative of the inside. So we'd end up with this 2x e to the x squared. That's if we're taking the derivative path. Now, this is where it helps to introduce the technique that technically speaking, is usually seen, if not sort of taught actively in pre-calculus. It's not a thing special for limits or integrals or derivatives, but we haven't necessarily had a lot of reason to use it until now, and that is called the U substitution, okay? So in particular, let's say that we are looking at this sort of integral, we're trying to do this um, antiderivative or indefinite integral, of 2x e to the x squared. Now, often recognizing the composition of functions, like the fact that it happened, is often one of the hardest parts. Here, it often helps to sort of look at the individual parts and see if you recognize that there is sort of a derivative of one piece lurking outside. So in particular, I look at this and I see that 2x floating outside and then I notice that there's that x squared as the sort of piece up at the top, right? The, the inner function or that sort of exponent part. And so this, the fact, right, that the derivative of x squared is 2x, that might cause us to suspect at least that we're trying to reverse a chain rule, right? That part of this antiderivative part um, is, is needing to reverse the chain rule because that thing was generated by the chain rule, right? That's the idea. So to do that, we start by letting u be that inside function, the thing whose derivative is also there. So in this case, that x squared, right? The inside piece up here. So when we do that, we also need to calculate du, meaning that we need to take a derivative of u with respect to whatever variable it is, so in this case with respect to x, and this gives us that du being 2x dx. All right, so what do we do with that? Well, now that we have the u and the du, remember, right, that the, the dx part of the integral, that's telling you what the variable is that you're trying to go with respect to. So that means that we can't really try to integrate until all of the variables are converted to the same thing, including that d whatever, dx, du, d whatever, all of those things need to match, okay? So in particular, what happens if we only do the u part of the substitution? Well, if I replace right that x squared with a u, but I leave everything else, now I have an x, a u, and a dx, meaning that since we have a mixture of this x and u, 
and u depends on x, that integral is still a dx integral. We can't yet do the antiderivative, right? If we have a mixture of letters in there, and I've only sort of done partial conversion, at least at this point in your calculus sort of background, there's really nothing to do with it. So we need to remember that we need to translate all of the variables over. In particular, we need to account for that g prime part of that chain rule form, that f prime g of x times g prime of x. And in other words, we need to figure out what to do with that du that we calculated earlier. So the easiest way to avoid errors with that process of changing from a dx to a du is to solve for dx in the du calculation and then substitute out the dx that's in the integral. So in particular, we had that du being 2x dx, right? Because we took the derivative of x squared to get 2x. The dx goes with the x stuff. The u, du goes with the u stuff. But then I can solve this for dx. So I can divide both sides by 2x. That gets me dx is du over 2x, right? But then I can substitute that into where the dx is in the integral. So to sort of go through the whole process, I started with this 2x e to the x squared dx. I substitute out first just the thing that I sort of made you to sub out, right? I was like, okay, I recognize that this x squared has this 2x outside, so I think this x squared is going to be a, a good candidate for my u, so I'm just going to substitute out that piece, right? Just that one u. And then I'm going to substitute out the dx to be what I solve for, that du over 2x, and then I try to simplify. So here, I have a 2x in the bottom, a 2x in the top, so those cancel out, and I get just e to the u du. But the good news is that now everything's a u, right? There's no x's left. The process of subbing out that du and that the, the du and the dx, right, changing across, got rid of the other x that was already there. So now I can integrate this with respect to u, because that's what the du means, and that gets me just e to the u plus c, right? So... This is saying, okay, you have e to something, but it's just a u, and you're doing it with respect to u, so I don't care if u is representing something else. That's the only sort of antiderivative that I care about. And so the indefinite integral then, right, the indefinite integral, the antiderivative of e to something is itself, and so then I get the plus c. But now I can put it back what my u was, right? Now I can return to the x's that it was given sort of initially as, which means that I end up with this e to the x squared plus c, okay? All right, so this is the basic sort of outline. Now, by far, the most common error that students make is to forget to sub out that dx, right? They, they get really focused on the, on the u part, and they try to sub in the u, and they forget the dx, either because they forgot to write, to write the dx, which is all kinds of bad, or they kind of messed up uh, and didn't sort of sub out the dx correctly. They just sort of wrote du instead of dx by accident. But the thing is, is that forgetting to do that tends to make the problem way harder, right? If I hadn't subbed out the du in the previous thing, I'd still have that 2x out front, and that would block me from doing the integral. So actually remembering to substitute out the dx tends to make the problem much easier, not harder, right? So it, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy here that like if you forget to do that, it becomes almost impossible to solve, which then makes you go back and look for an error. So it's a, it's a good idea to sort of make that mental check. Now, the other thing is we call this technique a u sub or u substitution, and we usually use a u when we do it but there's nothing special about the letter U here. Um, and in fact, you are welcome to use whatever letter or symbol or something you want. Um, the rule of thumb though, and this is sort of the easy part to mess up, especially if you're doing more than one of these, the rule of thumb is to make sure every time you do a substitution to use a new letter every time. So in particular, you wanna use a letter that hasn't shown up anywhere in the problem thus far and never ever use the same letter that's already in the integral. So if the original integral you were given was in terms of u, even though you're doing a u sub, don't use a u because you already have a u. That'll just generate lots of confusion because you'll be writing down something like u equals u squared, and that just mathematically is all kinds of bad. So um, feel free to use different letters, and importantly, always use a different letter than what you're looking at when you're doing the substitution, okay? There's another sort of, not necessarily error, but a, a, 
um, common thought that a lot of students have that they sort of need to capture all of the substitution all at once, basically do one substitution to rule them all, as it were. Um, and it turns out that not only is that not necessary, it's actually a pretty good way to make mistakes. So we have a whole separate thing on sort of how to actually recognize what to substitute and how to do multiple substitutions in order to make fewer mistakes. So this is, it's worth its own video, which is why I'm not digging into it here, okay? All right, so what do we do? Well, we introduced the idea of the use substitution and talked about some of the common errors when you're trying to apply it and really sort of tackled the idea of how to reverse the chain rule, right? That's the, that's the goal of the u sub. And much like the chain rule, u substitutions really almost unfortunately become fairly ubiquitous. They're everywhere moving forward. And really that's because function composition itself is pretty much everywhere, as you probably have noticed when you learn the chain rule, right? Once you learn the chain rule, you're suddenly using it on everything. Well, use substitution is very similar. Once you've learned the use substitution, you start using it everywhere because function composition is just that common. Okay, so that is that.